welcome to New Zealand and welcome to Kathmandu everyone. Lovely to have you here. Um, I'll give you a little bit of background about myself and then we'll get into it. So my name is Georgia Tagney and I've been working with Kathmandu for about five and a half years now and I actually started in the product team. I was a fabric technologist for about just under five of those years. So uh, working with the designers, designing and developing all of our different fabrics kind of based on the end use and their sustainability needs. Um, and then I did a bit of study in business and sustainability at Lincoln University, which is just about half an hour away. And last year, about halfway through last year, transitioned into my role now, which is ESG specialist for KMD Brands. And so KMD Brands is the parent company that owns Kathmandu, Rip Curl and Oboes. Have you heard of Oboes? They're uh, an American footwear company based in Bozeman. Uh, and I'm guessing you've probably heard of Rip Curl. Yep. Yeah, cool. So um, as a part of my role, a big part of it is our ESG strategy. Um, and I think one of the most common questions I've been asked since starting this role, <laughs> what is ESG? Can anyone tell me? Yeah? Environment, sustainability, and governance. Nearly. <laughs> Very close. Usually it's crickets sounding when I ask that question. Uh, it is environmental social governance. So, for a long time, we've talked about the term sustainability. And with the challenges the world's facing at the moment, so obviously the climate is changing. Um, we're trying to transition from a linear economy to a more circular economy. And then there's balancing those economic needs with societal needs. The term sustainability kind of feels a bit too um, slim and it kind of really only encompasses the environmental aspects of things. So with the, the changing nature of the world and the problems we're facing, we're transitioning to this environmental social governance way of thinking. And so an ESG framework is what businesses use to kind of measure their impacts in all of these areas. And investors and shareholders use this framework as a really good way to kind of measure how a company is performing in various different areas. And so, which is important because we're a publicly listed company. So what our shareholders and invest investors, I think and measure about our company is crucial. Um, so for us, the environmental aspect is kind of like measuring our carbon footprint uh, and reducing our emissions, which is huge. Um, then social, that's everything to do with our workers. So not only our direct employees, but that's all the employees throughout our supply chain. Uh, and so managing how everybody is treated and looked after. And then governance is... Um, our, our board and directors and the decision-making people. So within the ESG framework, we've created our ESG strategy and that is based on the three pillars, community, circularity and climate. And so to create this strategy, we went out to, oh, we used external contractors to conduct a materiality assessment for us. And so that's where they came in and interviewed uh, a whole bunch of staff and um, important stakeholders in our business, so external and internal, and kind of questioned them around what they thought would be most important for us to focus on as a business. And so that led us to these three pillars, which community circularity and climate also fall under the environmental social governance areas. And so within each of these pillars, we've set uh, all sorts of different goals and targets. So I'm going to kind of take you through those today, what we're doing in those areas and how we're kind of looking to work towards achieving our goals. And obviously, we are a B Corp certified um, company. Have you guys heard of B Corp? Um, so B Corp is a really well recognised uh, international certification and it's all about ensuring that we're balancing people and planet with profit so our business isn't just profit business and it's an exceptionally thorough um, framework and they basically go through and analyze every single aspect of your business 
with a fine tooth comb and so uh, to achieve the cert certification is a huge deal but it's also a really important commitment for us to show that we're on a journey of continuous improvement not just kind of sitting where we are. And so Kathmandu has been B Corp certified since 2019, but just recently we've also had Rip Curl and Oboe certified as well. So that's uh, super exciting for our group. Alrighty, so our first pillar is our people and our communities. And our first set of goals within that is to do with uh, sort of diversity and repre representation within our business. So not only is that uh, ensuring all genders are included and represented, it's also um, Indigenous people in Australia where a lot of our Rip Curl business is based. There are a lot of uh, Indigenous people in those regions. So Rip Curl has just recently released their Reconcili Reconciliation Action Plan, which is a framework as to how they're going to work towards educating and including their staff um, and working towards kind of better inclusion in those areas. And then not only this, but we support Pride Pledge and Rainbow Tick Association um, and our, our people team or our HR team is working towards gender, gender neutral communications. And we have um, a really strong uh, Pride team at Kathmandu, so it's really awesome all of the different initiatives that we get behind and support. Um, so it's just all about making sure our employees feel seen and included, which is a really core part of our business. Um, and then we move on to our supply chain. So as a kind of billion dollar group, we have a huge network and we spread across so many different countries and within that um, we work with a lot of different suppliers. And so we kind of break that down into tier one, two, three, and four suppliers. So our tier one is our finished product, so people that make our clothes and bags and tents and stuff. Um, material production, those who produce the fabric for our products, and then it kind of drills down into the raw material production and processing. And so within these tiers of suppliers, for all of our tier one suppliers, we ensure that they adhere to our code of conduct, which is all about kind of capturing wor um, working hours, ensuring that no one's being overworked, um, that they're being paid for overtime and they can only do X amount of overtime, um, ensuring that like their passports aren't taking off, taken off them, um, they have freedom to leave and that their living conditions are good. Um, and obviously that's a really difficult thing to monitor and historically we've done audits and surprise audits to kind of check in and see that companies are actually, uh, sorry, our suppliers are actually adhering to our code of conduct. But in reality, we're kind of concluding that this might not be the most effective way to do things because if you tell a supplier, we're going to come and audit you on Tuesday, then obviously <laughs> they're going to make sure everything's in order on Tuesday. Um, and so we have had a, a QR code that is in factories that workers can scan and it um, sends a message to a phone that we have here, a WeChat message, which can be used as a grievance mechan mechanism, which is great. So if anything is going on in the factory that we need to be aware of, the workers can anonymously contact us. And we have had a few instances where that has been used. Um, but again, that still doesn't give us the full picture of you know, how people are being treated and how people feel about their working environment. And so we're just, uh, actually at the moment, a couple of my team are over in Bangladesh introducing this tool with some of our suppliers. It's called Worker Voice. And again, it's a QR code that workers scan and it sends a survey to their phone in their own language. And it's basically just a questionnaire about all sorts of aspects of the factory, their work environment, that sort of thing. And again, it can be answered anonymously. So instead of just being a grievance mechanism that they can kind of ping when something goes wrong, it's more of a check-in and every employee has the opportunity to answer it. So we're kind of steering away from audits a little bit more into, I guess, a more thorough way of assessing things. Um, so that's our journey with our supply chain. And then, as I mentioned earlier, we support a whole lot of local 
um, community initiatives and have partnerships that we feel really bring value to our business or our business can kind of provide value to their organisations. Um, so beyond Blue and Graham Dingle Foundation are things like mental health support and then uh, Black Folks Too and Trees for the Future are all about encouraging environmental protection and get pe getting people out into the environment. So we make sure that we support things that actually align with our brand and our goals and what we're trying to do and potentially reduction of our impacts rather than kind of just chucking money where we think it'll look good. <laughs> like to do things with a bit more meaning. Uh, and then we also ensure we give our employees an opportunity to actually go out and help out in the community themselves. And so this is something Rip Curl has been doing so well for I think 21 years now. They have uh, an annual planet day where they get all of their uh, head office and distribution center staff out and volunteer in the community. So. Um, they have a nature reserve that they've been working on for about 10 of these years. And then this year we had our first Kathmandu Planet Day. So we're hoping to make this um, more of a tradition for us, which is really exciting. The staff were all raving about it. Um, it was really nice to get out of the office and do something with your hands and feel like you're actually making an impact. And it was really cool. We went down to uh, an estuary just outside of Christchurch and there were about 80 of us on the first day and then 50 on the second day and so it was really cool because we were like in weeding and mulching and all sorts of things and by the end of the day you can look around and you can actually see how much of an impact you've made. So that was really cool and obviously we want to look at how we can extend these things for our store staff and make it a bit more inclusive. But it's all great stuff, it's all a journey. Um, and so then we come to our second pillar, cir circular business models. This is the only pillar in which we've set brand specific goals. So under each pillar, each brand is working towards the same collective goal. But here we've set separate goals for Kathmandu, Rip Curl and Oboes, purely because we're all on quite different stages of our journeys within our products. Uh, so Kathmandu has had a really fantastic preferred fibres and materials strategy for a long time now and we have uh, a fantastic kind of technologist leading the whole thing. Uh, so we're a bit more established in our journey than Rip Curl is. So the goals that we have set is 100% um, responsible wool standard certified by 2025, 20, which sounds quite far away but the product team is already working on things for summer 2025. So decisions like this need to be factored in now. And so the RWS certification means that uh, the wool is coming from safe, safe farms. Um, it, is, it has guidelines around like water usage and feed and chemical usage and ensuring that the uh, sheep aren't mules. And we've already achieved 100% responsible down certification and had that for quite a few years now, which obviously was great because we use a whole lot of down in our sleeping bags and puffer jackets. And so that ensures that the down that we use is a byproduct from another industry. So no live plucking and otherwise would be going to waste, uh, which is crucial. And then our next commitment is that all polyester is recycled or recyclable by 2030. And so that means that we aren't using up limited resources uh, and ensuring that things can be recyclable is really crucial. So that kind of comes down to decisions that the designers need to make when designing the products. So in order to be recyclable, um, mono materials are easier. So if you're putting like three different fabrics in a garment, that makes it harder to recycle. Or if you're using a face fabric and a membrane, say they both need to be polyester because otherwise that makes it a lot harder to recycle if you put a nylon based membrane on the back. So there's all sorts of decisions that need to be um, considered when setting goals. And then uh, obviously we want to really stay ahead with our research and te technological development. So prioritizing bio based over petrochemistry um, when we're working on our new innovation. And so that's things like bio-based finishes to avoid really harsh chemicals. Um, so we've just implemented a mint-based 
odour resistant finish um, as opposed to what we were using before which was silver based. It's a bit nasty on the environment. So things like that, ensuring that we're keeping on top of what's in the market and looking for opportunities to scale up where we can. And another big thing for us is our waste. So for this first goal division of 90% of waste from landfill from our direct operations, so that is our head offices, our distribution centres and our stores. Um, and so obviously we offer recycling facilities uh, in things like our head offices, some of our stores, but a lot of our stores are in malls. So it actually gives us a lot less control over the facilities they have access to, uh, which is a real shame. And we're lucky in New Zealand, we have access to a lot of soft plastics recycling, but in Australia, uh, the soft plastics recycling is limited. The main um, company they were using, Red Cycle, was recently discovered that they had a couple of gigantic warehouses stuffed full of soft plastics that hadn't been going anywhere. So that's off the market now. Um, so for us, it's all about finding solutions. How can we um, offer more facilities? How can we get visibility on what we're actually doing? Uh, measuring our footprint so we can actually manage it, which is a big thing. And then primary and secondary packaging and promotional materials. So primary packaging is what goes on the garment, so like your swing tags, your boxes, um, stickers, anything like that. And then secondary packaging is everything that's used to transport it. So that's like your poly bags and boxes that it's stored in to move between distribution centres, uh, which is also a huge source of waste, but it's a necessary source for us at the moment because we manufacture over in um, Asian countries predominantly when garments are shipped um, from the vendor to here, they go through a big temperature change and that often leads products to become mouldy or damaged. And so it's quite crucial to keep them in the poly bags. Um, so again, that's just measuring and managing and looking at ways to improve. Can we Im increase our efficiency with how many garments are in a certain poly bag? Um, and so by 2030, it gives us a bit more time to reach that goal because it is quite massive. Um, and have you guys heard of circular economy? Cool, so as you can see, this is just, I thought this was just a nice way to kind of break it down. Uh, obviously recycling is great, but in the end it is still creating a waste stream. So at the moment we're all about figuring out how we can keep our products and our materials in circulation and out of landfill which is so important because I think it's something like 7% of all waste comes from textiles and about 70 to 80% of all uh, fibres and fabrics used in textiles either get uh, sent to landfill or incinerated, which is pretty alarming when you think about how finite the resources actually are. So if we keep chucking things in the bin, we're gonna run out. So we need to ensure that right from the design phase, we're thinking about the, the end of life of the product. And it's also super important for regulation. Regulation is always changing and more and more regulation is put in place. So who knows, in a couple of years, there might actually be regulation that says when you release a product, you need to have a solution for end of life. Um, so it's all about keeping on top of that. So like I mentioned earlier, it could come down to the fabric choice or the fibre choice when designing a product or designing it to be more easily repaired uh, or perhaps even turned into something else at the end of its life. And so a couple of cool things that we've been doing in this space, we recently launched our Catman Redo program and so that's a renewal and repair program where customers can send their gear back to us and once they're finished with it and then we will repair it, fix it up, and then it will be resold again um, as a used item so someone else can find a home for the garment and enjoy it. Uh, and then we've recently partnered with Apparel in about 24 of our Australian stores. And so this is just a textile return bin where people can bring back any old garments and they either get um, sent up for our redo program or uh, repurposed so they can be shredded back to fibre and used as um, insulation or couch stuffing or all sorts of different things 
And that, again, is just to ensure that things are com staying completely away from landfill and given another life, which is exciting. So we've just launched the pilot program and we're looking to extend into New Zealand and then hopefully much further if all goes to plan. And then TerraCycle um, is used by Rip Curl to recycle their wetsuits. So people can bring back their old wetsuits and then they get shredded up and turned into like the matting that's used on playgrounds and things like that. And they've actually, they're looking at uh, using some of that matting that's created from their TerraCycle wetsuits to create a playground right by their head office, which would be really cool. Uh, and then we come to our final pillar, which is our science-based climate action. And this is kind of a huge one for us. So it's all about reduction of scope one, two, and three emissions. What does that actually mean? Who knows? Do you guys know much about scope one, two, and three? Anything? Yeah, so it's, it's quite a broad one. Um, and it's all encompassing really. And we have been um, reporting on the, so we have a Toy2 toy certification, which is a local organization that kind of verifies our emissions to the mandatory categories that we have to report to. But now we are moving towards a recently verified science-based target. And so that um, s takes us from reporting on this much mandatory emissions to like tenfold. So scope one and two is quite a small part of the business. So that's the direct emissions from operating our stores and distribution centers and offices. So that is predominantly the electricity we purchase. Um, and in New Zealand, that's a lot more straightforward because we purchase our energy through one provider, Meridian, and uh, that's from Hydro Energy, which is a more renewable source, but then we go to Australia and their grid uh, isn't quite as clean as ours and so we have to purchase from various different suppliers and different energy types including coal, which is problematic. So we're looking at um, implementing a few solar projects around the place to be able to produce our own energy and bring those uh, emissions down. And then scope three emissions is pretty much everything else and so we've been reporting on um, business travel, so over the last few years obviously we haven't been travelling as much but now we're expanding internationally and people are getting out there again. Um, so there's a few emissions that we incur from various types of travel. And then probably the biggest one is our freight and so that is we have been uh, only reporting on upstream freight so that's shipping the products from the vendor to us to our distribution centres and then out to our stores or out to online purchases and so that encompasses uh, sea freight, air freight and road freight which is huge um, and then that covers our waste as well in scope 3 um, and what's it going to say? Oh, so yes, our scope 3 emissions are over 70% of our total footprint. So that's a huge category for us to tackle. And so just to give you an idea, this verified section is the mandatory emissions that we have been reporting on. And now for our science-based target, we have all of these to report on. Um, and so I feel a little bit like this. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's a huge learning experience for us and it's actually really important because the more we can understand about our footprint and our emissions, we can find solutions for reduction, which is super important. But it is quite a challenge because like our purchase goods and services, that's all our garments um, and products, wetsuits, all that kind of thing. It's really hard to get the information from suppliers. Um, particularly accurate information and so that's kind of where we're doing the work at the front end creating the good relationships with our suppliers um, through our grievance mechanisms and our code of conduct and all sorts of things like that, regular visits um, to ensure they understand why we need the information or how we can help them get the information and how it will actually be beneficial for them as well. So 
big old piece of work to do there, but it's all good learning. And it's all about kind of being open and transparent with um, on the outside to kind of say, well, obviously we're not perfect. We're doing a lot of great things, but there's a lot of, lot of work to do. Uh, and I think by kind of sharing the challenges, it opens up other businesses to share their challenges as well. And in that regard, you can kind of work together to find solutions, which is a great way to look at things. Um, do we have any questions? Yes. So in terms of your grievance procedures, a lot of um, organizations that have tried to instill that in supply chains have still found resistance to using them because of fear of retaliation from the own employers. It's kind of perceived that you don't have much control over them because they're a separate company. Have you found a lot of that in your grievance procedures? Um, so I think that's potentially why we're kind of trying a different angle is it it is accessible in, in the fact that it's a QR code, they can do it from their own phone and it's anonymous, but I still think at the end of the day, there is probably a bit of fear around um, being seen using it. So again, we're trying to make it something that every employee can do, and so it's, it doesn't kind of like single them out as being found out, so yeah. It's definitely a challenge. You seem, the company seems to be doing a lot of things that aren't necessarily just for the bottom line. And I'm wondering, is that, is the company more able to do that if they're not owned publicly? Or is it a privately held company? Is there any? No, so we're publicly owned. So like all of these decisions come from our, our board and our shareholders and things like that. So, um, and uh, we're, I'd say a lot of our strategy is influenced by our B Corp certification, so that's like a really good uh, validation of areas where we're strong or we need to strengthen. Um, and then obviously based on the materiality assessment. So I, and I think as, as a brand and as a company, we've always been like really passionate about doing things for the right reason, not just doing them because we'll get better investment if we look good on paper. So. I think that's why we're able to kind of do a bit more in this space because people actually care. Can you uh, explain again your role and what you do? Sure thing. Um, so I am an ESG specialist and I work with um, part of my teams over here, part of my teams at Rip Curl and then some in Melbourne. And there's about seven of us. And so my role is quite broad. Um, we, I've, I did a lot of work for our B Corp certification sort of over the end of the last year. Um, and then at the moment, I'm working on a lot of education around our goals and strategies. So talking to various different teams within the businesses, um, talking about the goals, setting the parameters, looking at how we can measure them. Can we measure them? Because we've found um, some of them we can't even measure. So we're looking for solutions uh, as to how to do that and kind of helping people along on that journey. Um, I'm also really involved in our annual reporting. So uh, as a business, we release a, an annual report every year, which is um, which needs to adhere to various different frameworks. So I'm kind of in the thick of GRI reporting at the moment. I'm not sure if you've heard of that, but um, so a lot of things like that and then I do a lot of project work as well so organizing planet day and driving some of the Catman redo and the apparel um, bins and things like that so it's, it's ever evolving and our team uh, and our directions changing all the time so we're kind of lucky enough that our roles evolve all the time um, yeah what's GRI reporting uh, so it's Global Reporting Index, and it's basically internationally recognised standards that business u businesses use in their annual reporting. Um, and so it gives you various different material topics. So it'll be all-encompassing. So it's uh, lots of things about our employees, like number of employees, uh, wages, um, genders, employment types, uh, and then it takes you through into the climate reporting, environmental, and then staff benefits or training hours. Um, so it's really, really thorough uh, reporting to just provide a bit more detail on companies. And I think a lot of shareholders kind of measure 
um, companies' performance based on what they see in the reporting as well. That, that's a great question. I think it's a really interesting balance because at the moment, like especially over this side of the world, the facilities to recycle fabrics and garments do not widely exist. So we're kind of de making these design choices now in the hope that say in like 10, 20 years time when the garment does reach its end, end of life that the facilities will exist. But uh, for Kathmandu as a performance brand, we have various fabric standards that our fabrics need to meet. So generally we won't make compromises on quality because another facet of circularity is that the garment is super durable and so it can stay in circulation for longer. So uh, it's all a bit of a juggle really. So I think it's important to kind of pick the priorities and go from there. Hey. What did you study in like university? A few things. I started off actually studying material science and then postgrad in science and then I did a diploma in business and sustainability um, out at Lincoln University. So that was a lot of like learning about uh, sustainability strategies and things like that. And we did like a case study on um, a, lo a local B Corp company, Sinlay. They're a big milk processing company. Um, so that was, it was really beneficial to actually kind of go in and analyze a business rather than kind of just like learning stuff and then trying to put it into play. Um, but from working in Kathmandu, obviously we, like we've been on this journey for quite a while so even in my five years in my previous role I had learned so much through that yeah. which was really cool. Do you see like a broad spread of degrees and backgrounds amongst your team and then like other people within ESG or is it kind of like you get that sustainable business like certificate and that's like what you need to get your foot in the door? Uh, no definitely definitely a widespread it's quite interesting often th like completely different things lead people to ESG um, and so I one of my secondary reports is to Frances Blundell she's our chief legal officer and ESG officer and so it was her legal background that then took her into the ESG space because there's actually a lot of cor cor correlation through that um, and then uh, in, in the supply chain space we had Gary who recently left and he uh, had a, a background in police and he was doing a lot of like undercover work uh, and exploitation stuff and, and so then he kind of came into it from the human rights aspect um, and then Thomas who's just started on my team he's a climate impact specialist so he's come from a, a climate back, background and so um, studied in climate stuff emission stuff that's what he's I don't know um, <laughs> um, that kind of thing. So it's it's all quite different. And then some of the team at Rip Curl, they've been in um, supply chain and kind of worked their way into different avenues. So it's definitely not just a, a box. You can kind of take experience and it'll lead you to anything. Along that line, or are there specific degrees that you look for, or are you just more looking for someone that brings those unique? Uh, I think I think both. It depends what kind of role we'd be hiring for because within this space it's so broad. So obviously when we hired Thomas we wanted someone to focus on our footprint and reducing our footprint. And so we looked for that experience but it would just totally depend on the role and the brand. Like you can look good on paper but if you're not the right fit for the brand or the company then it's a different story. So. Yeah, I think even if you don't have experience in a space, you can still bring so much to a role. So don't, yeah, don't let that stop you applying for anything. Okay. <laughs> um, how did the pandemic impact kind of your operations and business over the last few years? Um, it's been an interesting one for us. Uh, so as an apparel business we sell things and it's quite hard to do that when your shops are all closed. Mm -hmm. So that had a big impact um, and we also had impacts throughout our supply chain so factory closures uh, 
and things like that. And also through ordering, like it's really hard. We we work quite far in advance, and so it's really hard to predict what kind of order quantities you need. And a lot of businesses, uh, when the pandemic kind of kicked in, they just like cancelled orders. Uh, and so we made a commitment to kind of maintain our orders with our factories because they would have already purchased the materials or they needed the work. So it would have really put them on the back foot to stop that. Um, so yeah, really saw impacts throughout the whole supply chain um, from order quantities to actually being able to sell the goods. Um, and then, um, uh, and then yeah, through supply chain, when things started opening back up again, then there was like a massive rush to get product to store and so that was a huge bottleneck for shipping. Uh, there were so many delays and backlogs so then that would kind of lead you to having to air freight things as opposed to sh ship things by sea. Um, and then air freight became kind of slow because everyone wanted to do that and then that's way more expensive and um, a lot more a lot more of an impact environmentally as well. So it's really been a journey um, and things are kind of opening up and back on track now, which is exciting. But yeah, it's, we've definitely seen impacts throughout our whole business. We've been talking about like, even like earlier, just like how whenever you order, it's like a lot of the time you get like a lot more like plastic and like waste than you do actual product. So like for clothing and stuff, like ship things out, how do you guys kind of like reduce your footprint in that way, like with shipping? Uh, that, that's definitely a challenge, I think. We're, we're quite lucky we have like distribution centres in Australia and New Zealand and a lot like the predominant kind of shipping uh, for online purchases is within Australia and New Zealand so it's not having to send it over the other side of the world. It's definitely increasing as our business grows internationally so that's probably more Kathmandu but um, for Ripkill we have also various distribution centres uh, over the other side of the world as well. Um, we've recently changed to 100% recycled online shipping satchels so um, that's like a little thing we can do and for apparel it's not needing to be put in like big boxes with heaps of prote protective packaging so um, that's lucky as well but yeah definitely a challenge hard, hard to avoid sending things in plastic when we're sending them around about the place in different temperatures had a lot of resistance from your suppliers in terms of opening their operations up to your audits um, and your kind of push to, um, not necessarily push, but your kind of influence in terms of being more sustainable, especially on the human side, in terms of the human resources? Yeah, so uh, we, we have quite good relationships with a lot of our suppliers because we've been working with them for many years and so we try and like work with them rather than saying like you've got to do this now and so that was kind of another thing with audits we didn't like to spring too many random audits on them because then they kind of lose trust with you like if you're going to do this all the time then you obviously don't trust us and so instead of if something was pinged in an audit, we'd kind of be like, oh, well, how can we work with you to improve this? Um, and they had kind of like three chance kind of thing. And so if we weren't seeing things improve after that, then we kind of move away from partnering with them. But uh, yeah, I th again, it's all about relationship and kind of uh, working with them. Like they, they, they are the experts in their field and we can't come along and say like, you have to do this now. Uh, but I think it's helping them to see the benefit for them because so many more businesses are wanting to partner with um, suppliers that are more proactive in these spaces. You can kind of help them to understand that actually this could be super beneficial for their business as well. It's not just something that we would like them to do. But again, obviously, it's met with resistance sometimes because it might come as a cost or... Um, a big change of practice and in some countries like working practices are very ingrained people are quite resistant to change so yeah patience and hand-holding <laughs> how have you used your background in material science with what you're doing now um it's actually i found it really helpful because in the materials team we actually drive a lot of 
the strategy um, with material choices and sourcing choices and that kind of thing. So I had that knowledge and also um, had relationships with a lot of people in the business um, before moving on to the next role. So I found that super beneficial um, because previously it would come to reporting time of the year um, and someone would say, we need these figures in a week and then in that time you'd be like, I didn't even know we were needing to uh, report on these things. And so it's kind of taking that experience, I've been able to utilise the relationships I've already formed over the last few years to kind of um, work on projects together and also from a reporting aspect, it's been really beneficial having an understanding of what we can and can't do and how we can um, look at improving things or perhaps what direction we're heading in. Thank you. No worries.